Hi, uh, I'm Tom Carraher. I'm a CS major and I'm a senior here at MSU. And I'm actually here today just to give you guys a break from some of the math. Um, now, my goal with simulated annealing isn't to go into all the details and specifics on it. I want to kind of introduce you to some of the concepts involved, tell you how it works, and show you basically what it does. Um, all right, so to start with, what is annealing? Uh, does anybody in here do any work with metallurgy or glasswork? Or okay, good. If I'm a little off on the details, hopefully nobody notices. Um, basically, in metallurgy, uh, with simulated annealing, you heat a metal or an alloy to a very high temperature, and you let it sit there long enough for the uh, atoms in the metal to reach thermal equilibrium. Now, I'm not sure exactly what that means, but um, and it has something to do with basically the high energy state, and they're all kind of randomly dispersed throughout. Uh, you cool the metal then on a very specific and gradual uh, thermal schedule, and you stop at each phase in that schedule um, and allow time for the uh, particles in the metal to reach their thermal balance at that temperature. You continue doing that basically down to ambient room temperature. Um, when they settle, uh, as, as it cools, uh, they tend to settle into sort of an optimal crystalline uh, structure. And the reason I'm kind of going over this is this basic process is sort of the inspiration for simulated annealing as we're going to use it. All right, now what is simulated annealing? Well, basically, simulated annealing is just an intelligent random search function. Um, it has a couple of characteristics um, and, and things that it uses that actually make it really effective for approximating uh, the global optimum solution for a given solution space that you're working with. Uh, the first thing is iterative improvement. That's fairly straightforward. It goes through a series of cycles. And in each cycle, ideally, it's trying to find something, a better solution than its current working solution. What's important about that is um, just the idea that we're not actually looking for a best solution. We're just always trying to improve on whatever our current solution is. Uh, it uses local random search, so basically whatever our current working solution is, wherever we sit within that solution space, we're kind of looking at our immediate neighbors and, and trying to see if one of them is better. Um, and we're doing that rather than sampling throughout the entire solution space. Uh, exploration. We have the ability with simulated annealing to walk around our neighborhood where we are um, and maybe try a lot of our different neighboring solutions before we give up and move on um, to the next iteration in our trial. And then greed. Um, with greed, basically, the simplest way to explain it is we're always picking something that's better. And the way the, the uh, search algorithm behaves, early in the search, we really explore more freely. We're willing to be wrong more often. We're willing to accept worse solutions or to look around more. Uh, but as the search progresses and we get closer and closer to approximating that global optimum, we start to become much greedier until we reach a point where we're basically not accepting anything that's not an improvement. And now I'm just kind of visually demonstrating some of those same concepts. Like I said, iterative improvement is pretty straightforward. We start at one, we're trying to get something better with two, better with three, better with four, and so on. Uh, local random search, if you just let our X node here be our current accepted solution, this is kind of what we're doing. So we're not sampling throughout the whole solution space, because if we did that, we'd basically wind up with a random answer. Um, we're just sampling candidate solutions from our local area and testing them to see if they're better. Um, exploration. We probabilistically accept worse solutions. Now, what that means for us um, with simulated annealing is, as we're going through our solution space, there's potentially a lot of these local minima or maxima. and with the greedy search, it's very easy to get stuck somewhere in here early and you not be able to climb back out. So some of the exploration functionality with simulated annealing makes it such that if we do wind up getting stuck in here, we have some mechanism to at least try and get over the ridge and work back towards this global optimum. Uh, greed, uh, like I said earlier, basically if it's better, we always accept it. And we have that same problem with if we get trapped here, uh, the greed in this will not let us get out. Oh, and to back up. Um, with exploration, if we're, if we're freely exploring the solution space later in the search, as we approach that, 
Um, if we're ex exploring too freely and we're too willing to accept the worst solution, late in the search we might find that we actually move away from an optimum. And so that's why later in the search we become greedier and less willing to explore. Okay, here's uh, sort of a generic form of the simulated annealing algorithm. And the first thing we do is we just generate a random solution. Our starting solution is arbitrary. It doesn't matter. We just need one. And we just calculate the energy of that solution. And of course, the way you calculate that is going to vary depending on the type of problem you're working with. Um, set an initial temperature. And if I have time, uh, I'll go into some of the problems with selecting a lot of these starting parameters because there are some issues with it and it varies so much by the problem you're working with. But we'll save that for later if there's time. Um, but we'll pick some starting temperature that's sufficiently high to allow our search to work properly. Uh, and then basically we just gradually reduce that temperature towards a cutoff temperature. And until we reach that cutoff temperature, we're just going to keep running through this loop. All right. First thing we do is take whatever our current working solution is, and we're going to dump that into a test solution. And that's what we're going to be manipulating and testing. And then. For n iterations, what these are are Monte Carlo, Monte Carlo cycles. And I'll come back and, and show you what that is uh, kind of visually in just a minute. But for however many Monte Carlo cycles we've chosen to use, we're going to go through this process here, where we first adjust that test solution. And usually that's just some one or two small changes made to it. And then we're going to calculate the energy of that resulting solution. And we're going to take the difference of that and our original solutions energy. And then based on that, we're going to make a decision on whether we want to accept or reject this new uh, solution. So basically what we're looking at, if this is a negative value, in, the, in this example we're searching for a, a global minimum. So if this is a negative value, that means that we had an improvement and we're automatically going to accept it. So we just update our solution and update the uh, energy value for that solution. Now, if this is not an improvement, we're not immediately going to reject it. What we're going to do is use this function right here to determine uh, a probability for accepting it. And what this does, you don't need to necessarily work it out exactly, but what you can see from looking at this, we're raising e to a negative exponent. And because that's fractional in there, as the temperature is very high, that value is going to be very low, giving us a much larger value. Uh, when we raise e to that negative exponent. And similarly, if, the, uh, if our error was very positive, meaning basically this was much worse than the, our previous solution, this value is going to be much bigger negative value, which is going to result in a higher number at the end, and a, or I'm sorry, a smaller number at the end, and a much lower probability that we accept it. Right. If we wind up accepting it based on that, then we do the same as above, where we just update our solution with our test solution and then update the energy value for our working solution. And then we repeat this throughout our Monte Carlo cycles. And then once that's done, we drop our temperature. And we keep continuing through this loop until we reach our cutoff. And then whatever we have there should be a fairly good function to, uh, or a fairly good representation of, of a solution for the problem we're working with. And what these Monte Carlo cycles that I was mentioning are doing um, if you notice, if we rejected the solution within that Monte Carlo loop, we didn't start over with our original solution. That loop allows us to make additional changes to our test solution. So even though we may reject that test solution, say we're in here somewhere, so we may test this one and reject it because it was worse. But rather than just starting over from there, what we do is we make additional changes. And by doing that repeatedly, we actually let it kind of walk its way up. And that's part of what gives it the ability uh, to walk out of these local minima. And that's where a big part of the power for the, this algorithm comes from. All right, uh, I have a demo uh, program that I'm going to show you guys today. And what I'm solving is the traveling salesman problem. Basically, what that problem is, is you have a salesman who uh, has a, a set of cities that he needs to go through and, and sell to. And he wants to find the most efficient route possible to travel through each city exactly one time and end back in his starting city so that he can just loop through until he retires. Um, but there's, of course, a lot of search methods that you could use. But I just want to compare it to these two to show you some of the benefits of simulated annealing. 
With a brute force search, the good thing is you are, if there is an optimum solution, you will find it. The bad news is that you need n to calculate uh, n factorial solutions to be sure that you found the best one. Or, excuse me, n minus 1 factorial. Now, as an example, if we have 25 cities and we could calculate 1 trillion tours per second, which I can't do, um, it would take us over 19,000 years to actually fully test the solution space and come up with an answer. And we just don't have that kind of time. Uh, with a greedy search, of course, this is much, much quicker. But the problem is that because we're only at any point accepting something better than what we currently have, and a problem like this potentially has a lot of local minima or maxima, greedy search gets stuck and it can't get out. And so it's very unlikely to find a good solution for you. Okay, and I have a quick demonstration I want to show you. And we're going to start small, and I'll run this a couple of times. All right, for this first one, you may not be able to see what's really happening, but you should see that it finds a decent answer. But you're going to see a bunch of pink lines come up in sort of a random configuration, and then it'll work towards something that looks like a decent solution. And so we see, and it should find that same one, because this is a relatively small solution space. But if we start cranking this number up, we'll try 10, 2, and, and that looks like that's going to be the optimal one for those points. Then if we go ahead and crank this up to, say, 15, we should start running into problems uh, where it's not always finding the best solution. So this one's at 1573. I'm going to write some more. 1379. It's working better today than it was yesterday. All right, we'll go to 25 then. You'll see we find an answer to this 25 quickly, so maybe this is a good one to show you. So we get 2250, 2338. So you see, we don't always get the same solution. Sometimes it's a little better. Sometimes it's a little worse. But in most of these cases, it looks like it at least finds a pretty good solution. And that's what simulated annealing is for, is to quickly get you a pretty good solution. And actually, I think that's basically what I have prepared for you today. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Yes? You nailed the, where in my industrial engineering had you nailed the enigma discussion? Excellent. Excellent, because I just did kind of a quick skim of a, a Wikipedia article. <laughs> Anybody else? The code that you were using there, did you develop it yourself? Yes, that was mine. And, and that was a very naive implementation. I didn't do any work as far as uh, trying to calculate good parameters to use. Um, as you get with larger and more complicated problems, the parameters you choose to start with as far as like your number of Monte Carlo trials, what your starting temperature is, um, what your rate of temperature decay is, um, and, and several other things actually becomes much more important. You get a, a lot of, uh, or a high degree of variability in your answers or your results if you don't properly select those parameters. Um, and if anybody's interested in simulated annealing, a quick Google search will actually show you a lot of papers that uh, discuss different methods for selecting those parameters. Any other questions? All right, thank you all for coming.